So let me welcome everybody to, uh, to Lowe's, uh, today's colloquium at Radboud University. Um, you see our nice uh, uh, central building that, uh, uh, of our university. Of course, we're now all distributed uh, in our homes and, uh, uh, and, and happy that we welcome colleagues from our university, but also from abroad. Uh, who are interested in the latest results of the Event Horizon Telescope that was uh, presented yesterday. And I'm very proud that we have uh, three of the leading scientists who've been really deeply involved in this work uh, here as our speaker, working also in, in our department and are willing to give a public lecture uh, for, uh, for, for you. Let me introduce them briefly. Uh, first of all, the Monika Moschibrotska, who is an assistant professor at our uh, university. She came uh, here um, already many years ago. She's now assistant professor. She came as a postdoc. She did her PhD in uh, Warsaw, uh, at the University of Warsaw. She uh, worked at the Copernicus Center there. She moved then to Illinois, uh, working with, with Charles Gami, uh, leading uh, uh, theorists working on GRMHD simulation. Then she worked, uh, went to the University of Nevada and then came to Radboud. Uh, what makes her very unique in the world is she's uh, one of the few people, in fact, the pioneering uh, theoretician who uh, is able to actually calculate radiative transfer in curved space-time, in general relativity. Uh, it's a polarization is a very difficult uh, subject, not only observationally in radio astronomy, it's a very difficult topic. Uh, but also theoretically, and and and, and Monica pioneered some of the uh, the methods and uh, that that we're using now that may, uh, enable us to uh, calculate polarization uh, around black holes. This is not an easy thing. I would not be able to do this. To be quite uh, quite quite clear about this, um, then we have uh, Sarah Isaun, who is a a PhD student. Um, she. Um, did her bachelor at McGill University, then came to Radboud as a, a summer student, and then did her master here and, and her PhD. She really specializes in observational techniques. And she already, you know, despite not even having finished her PhD, um, has a lot of leading positions within the EHT. She's been uh, leading, uh, co-leading the calibration work in the EHT in the beginning. She has been uh, at the telescopes. Uh, observing, and she um, is leading some of her own, her own observational programs, uh, is actually in a number of committees already in the EHT, and uh, was also deeply involved in the observational parts of, um, of, of getting this image. I forgot to mention that Monica is also chair of the working group for polarization. As a theorist, she was overseeing not only the theory work uh, that was done, but also the observational part. And I think that's something that makes, a, uh, makes it very special. Um, and then we have Alejandra Jimenez Rosales, who uh, came from Mexico originally, University of Mexico, National University of, of Mexico, uh, then did her PhD at the Ludwig Maximilians University in, uh, in Munich, working actually in the uh, Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics, in the infrared group, uh, the group of, of Reinhard Genzel, uh, with uh, Jason Dexter as the direct supervisor. And uh, after getting a PhD, she uh, came to Radboud. And she you know, already saw the excitement of the measurements that were done with gravity, where people saw uh, infrared flares going around uh, the black hole in the center of our Milky Way and the polarization. Uh, uh, patterns that, that we see in, in, uh, uh, in this data. And now she witnesses the polarization in the Event Horizon Telescope data. So she sees it from both sides. And now I've talked enough, and uh, I still don't see that YouTube, uh, the link is working, which is a bit of a pity. And um, I nonetheless hand over to Monica to uh, present her talk. Uh, thank you, Heino. I, I thought that you want to mention one more thing. Oh, no, okay. I, I want to, of <laughs> yes. course, we have to say this is of all work done by the Event Horizon Telescope, and our participation has been uh, made possible, uh, of course, by our university, but also by the European Research uh, Council, with, uh, who funded uh, us uh, for a long time. And so we're grateful to, uh, to that. And, and in fact, all the other European partners and uh, partners in the EHT that, who made that all possible. Thank you. 
All right, thank you very much, uh, Heino, for this very nice introduction, very detailed introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am really delighted to be able to talk to you today uh, to give an introductory overview talk about the newest uh, results from the Event Horizon Telescope, namely the discovery of magnetization in a ring of light around the black hole shadow uh, in the galaxy M87. Uh, and, uh, you know, before going into details that will be given by Sarah and Alejandra, I would like to give a few remarks uh, that will hopefully uh, help everyone to, uh, to understand what is actually visible in this image. But let's uh, start from the beginning. Uh, what is the Event Horizon Telescope? It's a virtual telescope made of several elements uh, which are spread uh, across the globe, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, they once in a while point towards M87 or the black hole in the center of our galaxy and co they collect light. All these elements, all these uh, uh, single telescopes uh, in the array uh, uh, observe at the same wavelength that is equal 1.3 millimeter, uh, uh, which is close to, to radio waves. So all these elements, EHT telescopes look more or less like radio antennas. And these antennas are of course not physically connected as shown in the picture. Uh, once the data is recorded at each site, it's taken to one place and combined into a data set that then can be used to construct this kind of images. Uh, and because effectively this telescope is as large as Earth, uh, it has enormous resolution power uh, that allows us to image uh, objects as small as black holes. And in 2017, we observed uh, with this telescope uh, the core of M87 galaxy and also many other objects. And these observations uh, in 2017 were uh, good enough for the first time that to, to allow us to construct the image of uh, M87 black hole shadow that you already saw uh, two years ago. And uh, we actually, back in 2017, uh, because of very good weather conditions, EHC managed to observe M87 for four days. So we have actually four images of the black hole, not just one, and, but we always show April 11 as the best one because this, uh, on this day, the, the basically, uh, we had the most of the data collected. And since this initial uh, discovery, we were pondering what is producing this uh, ring emission, this plasma that we see glowing uh, you know, could be falling towards the event horizon or uh, could be on its escape route or could be simply rotating around uh, the horizon. Uh, another question, open question is, is this black hole spinning uh, or, you know, how is this ring going to look like in the future? Uh, finally, how is this ring uh, connected to the jet uh, that we see in M87, uh, that M87 core is producing? By the way, jets are often seen in black hole systems. These are streams of plasma, ionized matter, uh, which are accelerated to speeds that are comparable to the speed of light. And they are sometimes so powerful that they can escape the black hole, but also the galaxy, and they traverse entire galaxy and, and propagate way beyond uh, the galaxy. And this actually happens in M87. Uh, so what are the properties of the M87 ring measured back in 2019, where the ring is only 42 micro arc seconds in diameter. This is really small, corresponds to nearly you know, the size of the black hole itself. Uh, given the mass, we know, you know how should this radius uh, should be. It's almost perfectly circular, and it also has this brightness asymmetry. It's brighter on the south side. Uh, and finally, this uh, ring has uh, so-called very um, high brightness temperature. What does this mean? It means that approximately that plasma that is emitting this radiation is very, very hot. In fact, uh, these electrons, uh, these uh, particles that are emitting light uh, have uh, thermal speeds that are approaching speed of light. We call such plasma relativistically hot plasma. Uh, this also means that this emission that we see in a ring is produced by synchrotron proce process. What is syn synchrotron process? Uh, so when the plasma is hot, uh, it becomes ionized and it will have free electrons. Uh, these charges will fill magnetic fields and gyrate around it. 
uh, and the gyration motion uh, is associated with the production of light. And we call this uh, uh, a synchrotron emission. And the synchrotron emission actually has this property uh, that is, it's basically polarized. What is polarization in the first place? Well, what is light in general? Uh, it's a wave, it's an, an electromagnetic wave. Uh, the electric vector of this uh, electromagnetic wave oscillates and the direction of the oscillation is that we, we call it a polarization direction. And also keep in mind that light rays are made of many waves propagating together in packages. So if we, if this different way electromagnetic uh, uh, wave uh, fields are oriented randomly with respect to one another, then um, this uh, individual direction of polarization could average out to zero. Then the, the light means it's unpolarized. So in addition to uh, polarization direction, we also have to think about uh, polarization fraction, or in other words, how much fraction of light is oscillating in the same direction. And synchrotron radiation in particular can be up to 100% polarized. So all light waves can be nicely organized. So in comparison, for example, the natural, uh, natural light that our eyes see is unpolarized. Um, all right. What can we learn from light polarization, specifically when we talk about synchrotron radiation? Well, imagine a magnetic field line, the blue stick on this plot, and imagine electron gyrating around it. This is the black dot. Uh, and the gray arrow shows the direction of emitted light, more or less. And the green uh, tick shows the direction of light wave electric vector oscillation. So in this kind of simple situation, this electric vector, uh, the green tick, uh, would be at the 90 degrees, would be perpendicular to this magnetic field line. Now, what we see in the M87 image, and here you can see um, a scientific version of polarimetric image that we released yesterday, the ticks represent light electric field vector. So on the top of a gray background that represents light intensity, the tick direction is the electric field vector direction, and its color represents how much or what fraction of light is polarized. So in this case, it's only small fraction. It's 15% at most. Now in our press release image, uh, we show this polarization ticks in form of lines that are overplotted on the top of this uh, intensity maps. Uh, this was uh, done to make the image look more appealing uh, but here one has to only understand that these lines do not represent magnetic fields. They represent the direction of light wave oscillation as seen from our point of view here on Earth. Is the field, a magnetic field in a ring perpendicular to these lines? Not necessarily. The light we see in the images comes from um, a very deep gravitational potential of a black hole and that wraps itself around the object due to gravitational uh, uh, light bending gravitational pull. So to understand this underlying magnetic field, we have to actually come up with some kind of theory. Uh, and uh, this should go to the next slide. <laughs> All right. Uh, so basically, once we have a 3D model of magnetic fields around the black hole, using models of emission and transport of light in strong gravity, we can construct a model images. Uh, we then can compare those to real image and infer whether you know model is consistent with observations or not. From that, we can guess uh, what is the geometry of magnetic field in M87 ring. And we found that in case of M87, these magnetic fields may be twisted, but they have, may have a significant so-called vertical component that is basically perpendicular to, to the, some accretion disk around this black hole. And you will hear more about this modeling from Alejandra. All right. And finally, 
why are we interested in magnetic fields around black holes uh, in, in their shape and strength? Well, models of accretion flows onto black holes uh, tell us that magnetic fields and magnetic forces are in control of how black holes swallow matter. Uh, they control how the matter infall occurs. Uh, the magnetic fields will also therefore impact how the source will be changing or evolving. Uh, and magnetic fields uh, can be also strong. Uh, they can even stop matter from falling onto the horizon uh, and they can help the matter to escape uh, into a jet. And we are actually uh, very interested in finding out how this process actually happens in reality uh, because uh, we see jets not only in M87 uh, system, but also in many other galaxies out there uh, and uh, these, are, these jets are, could be very large structures reaching beyond the, our, their own galaxies and they carry energy from the black hole, you know, to entire galaxy. And now we have finally, you know, another critical element uh, of the story that can help us, you know, to understand uh, how, how, how these jets are formed. Okay, and then finally, before we move on to details. I would like to underline and stress that this image and this new results and the interpretation is a team effort. There are many people who contributed to this data calibration, analysis, imaging, and modeling. Uh, not all of them are shown in this picture uh, of, of a workshop uh, that we held in Bonn in, back in 2019. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is how this, this kind of science is, is, uh, uh, is being done. It's an effort, a team effort, really. And I would like to, to acknowledge that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for uh, this brief introduction. And I think we switch right away to the next speaker, who is Sarah, which is Sarah Isaun. Sarah, go ahead. Thank you. All right, so I'll be continuing from Monica and I'll be talking more about the observational parts of our work. If there's one takeaway uh, to get from my portion of the talk is that it's really hard to do polarization. That is the main takeaway and I'll show you a little bit why that is. So Monica talked a little bit about the EHT array um, the Event Horizon Telescope, when we observed in 2017, when we collected our data, was made up of eight telescopes at six different locations. We had six single dishes and two phase arrays. Um, because M87 is a northern source, the South Pole Telescope actually cannot observe it. So only seven of them actually see M87. Now, what is the most striking thing if you look at our telescopes is that it all look completely different from each other. The reason for that is that our EHT team actually borrows telescopes. We don't build them uh, to make our experiment. We borrow telescopes that have been designed for different radio science who just happen to be at the perfect sites for us to observe our radio waves at 230 gigahertz. And because they look so different, it's really, really hard to, um, to calibrate them to make sure we understand them because they're not all the same. You can't just apply our knowledge of one telescope to all the other ones, we have to really understand each of them, how they behave, how they move, and how they observe. Now, uh, what the EHT team did is, is actually equip all of these telescopes with receivers to observe at 230 gigahertz with recording equipment uh, in common, and also with what we call quarter wave plates um, that actually uh, make all of these telescopes observe circular polarization which means all of these telescopes observe the exact same polarization modes uh, from the black hole, which helps us then um, combine the data in different polarization combinations and make what we call you know, total light, linear polarization, and circular polarization data. So what we published in 2019 was our total light um, uh, images, our total intensity, and what we're publishing today is what, or yesterday is our linear polarization information. So understanding our telescopes is a really important part of everything we do with the EHT. A large part of our telescope understanding was made uh, before 2019 to publish our total light uh, images. Um, but for the last two years, uh, one specific aspect was spent, you know, 
a long time to try to figure it out. And it's called polarization leakage and it's underlined here. So from all these different effects that can mess up our data and actually corrupt it and um, uh, contaminate it, there's one part that really affects polarization signal and that is polarization leakage. The reason for that is that the polarization signal from the uh, source is really weak. And so it is very sensitive to contamination. And because we observe also something that is directional, this direction of the wave oscillations, even any kind of leakage that may cause it to change direction would affect our conclusions. So it's very important to understand uh, what is this leakage from all our instruments? How do we remove it? And what effect does it have on our images? So, and I can tell you this is really not an easy task. And we are perhaps working with the most complex radio interferometer that exists right now. And so it was really a really difficult and arduous and team effort to get here. So how do we do this? Um, we use a technique called aperture synthesis to image with the EHT. We observe our, our source for a very long time and Earth's rotation beneath our feet helps us fill what we call our coverage, our virtual mirror. And so we combine all these different data from uh, in time and in space across our virtual mirror and then our image uh, uh, comes together. What's nice is that um, as the Earth rotates, the source also rotates on the sky. So if we're trying to uh, separate, um, for example, what is contamination from the telescope and what is actually signal from the source, um, this is where this effect is really uh, useful for polarization calibrations. So say you have your source that moves on the sky, over time, it makes an arc on the sky for the telescope, but the contamination from the telescope itself doesn't move, it stays on the ground. So what we do is using our data, we combine these different arcs from these different telescopes and then try to kind of triangulate in some way, what is the contribution uh, from the instrument from each telescope and remove that and then make an image of the true polarization signal that comes from the source. So this is what we did um, for our first step. Right after our big 2019 result, we got right back to work and we said, hey, now we've done total light. Let's look at polarization. Let's see what we have to show. We worked for about two months to try to get our softwares up to date to do polarization imaging. And we had our first attempt at making polarized images in July, 2019. So just a couple months after a big announcement, you know, we got right back to it into working on new science with the EHT. So we met in Bonn in Germany for a workshop and we split our teams into three software teams uh, using three imaging softwares that we understood pretty well. So we have the EHT imaging software uh, that was led by Andrew Chale at Princeton. We have the Pulsal software that was led by Ivan Marti Vidal at the University of Valencia. And we have the LPCAL software, which is developed by NREO and uh, an enhancement of it called GPCAL led by Jung Ho Park uh, from Kazi in South Korea. So again, a very diverse team of researchers working on this with our different, um, with our different uh, teams. And so at that workshop, we looked at polarization for the first time and imaged you know, using just our own user choices of what we should do with the softwares and the data to get an image. And what we got was um, a ring of the same size in our total light. And then for our polarized images, we got everybody got this kind of ring with a patch in the Southwest. This was the first time we really saw images um, of, in polarization of M87 this close to, to the black hole. And it was really terrific that already we saw three softwares that were showing the same thing. And also our leakage terms, which you can see here, uh, are really consistent between the three softwares. So we were already really excited. We said, hey, we finally see consistency between these different images. Now we really need to make sure we understand whether this pattern is real, right? And whether there's any introduction of any effects that may change this pattern, either from the instrumentation leakage or from the user choices from these softwares, these buttons of each software. So the next, uh, so after that, of course, we celebrated, which Monica already showed. This was, you know, the happy faces of people seeing polarized images of a black hole for the first time, which is freaking awesome. It's just so cool um, to be able to do that with the EHT. So of course, we're all really happy and, um, and, and glad that we were able to do this, but there was a long journey ahead. So the next step is to systematically test our software. So we had all these buttons, right, um, from all our softwares, and we want to make sure we choose the right buttons that give us the, the right answer, the answer we want. 
So uh, we optimize our algorithm with an objective performance assessment to recover a truth image structure, which we can input, and the instrumental uh, leakage, which we also input. So we created these six different data sets, which have you know, different structures. The soma are crescents. We have a disk here that doesn't have the shadow in it. And they all have you know, different polarization patterns. Some are more complex. Some are uh, you know, kind of simple. Some have strong polarization. Some have weaker ones. And we wanted our softwares to try to reconstruct all of these. And we tested loads and loads of parameters to make sure we chose the ones that best represented the truth images, um, which, we, which we obviously knew the truth. Whereas for M87, we don't know the truth. So we want to make sure we objectively choose the right parameters that give us the truth. Um, so we wanted a single imaging script per our five imaging software, so three imaging and two posterior exploration algorithms um, that give us these optimized parameters. So we tested tens of thousands of imaging parameters uh, combinations systematically for all our software. We generated this you know, synthetic data, this simulated data, um, where we know the truth image behind it. Um, we tested all the parameters against our imaging method. We created images, uh, and then we ranked them um, uh, based on how good is the image reconstruction compared to the truth. And then the best ones, the best sets of parameters, are what we then took and applied on the M87 data to get an M87 image. So. For our April 11 data set, this is what the best results um, were for our five softwares. And you can see here again, we have our um, five softwares. These are the three imaging ones, and we have two new posterior exploration ones, uh, DMC developed by Dom Pesci at SAO, and Themis uh, developed by Avery Broderick and his team at Perimeter Institute. And so all five softwares, again, gave a ring of the same size and with this patch in the Southwest. So now we're saying, OK. We've had parameters that we've tested. We know that they're able to recover the truth images and they're robust and they get the right leakages and everything. And we still get this patch, the same one that we saw at the workshop in 2019. So we say, okay, this patch is real. Um, but how much of this patch is real is the next question. So is there are these other features in our images actually real too? Um, so the next step, um, oh yeah. And so the average um, of these five, images are, are what we had at the end, um, which is what we, we used as a representation for our famous image, uh, which is this other representation Monica showed. So this one is April 11. And then we observed it for other three days. So these are the other three days as well. Um, so you can see that this patch is consistent and we see it for all four days. So we know it's definitely real, um, but there was some other structure around the ring that we had to make sure was real too. Um, so how do we how do we uh, check which part of the ring is real? So we produced what we called our thousand set images per software, where we actually changed the instrumental leakage uh, that we input in our data. So say if, if the leakage we we actually derive is slightly off, does that really change our image? So this is examples of what the leakages are sampled uh, for each method. You can see quite a huge range um, of all these different numbers. Um, so. Uh, we're looking at huge ranges of different leakages and, and their um, images in this thousand image set. So if we look at um, our set of images, this is kind of how much they vary. You will see that there is some variation here. The reason why there's this variation is because the polarization signal here is really, really weak. So it is the part we have the least certainty on. But you can see in our thousand set, there is a very prominent region here that doesn't change. It has the same amount of polarization fraction. It has the same uh, polarization direction, this kind of spiral swoop. And it's robust to all our D-term uh, changes, our D-term tweaks. So this region is really what we're most certain about. And then we, um, we definitely don't trust the structure we see up here. So this gave us confidence in the structure we were able to see, because from this structure, like Monica said, we're able to infer information about the magnetic field. And so we wanted to make sure that whatever we infer is correct. So another nice thing is if you look at this distribution in our thousand set images um, along the ring, so if we just look at uh, the intensity and the angle along the ring, uh, we can see some differences. So all the softwares are, of course, uh, consistent with each other. But across days, there's actually differences. 
So let's take one of the softwares and look at it. So this is how the intensity of polarization uh, along the ring looks like. And at the beginning of our campaign on April 5th, the peak is here. And then on April 11, it has shifted. So it's, you can see in our images that actually part of the ring, it starts brighter on the bottom. And then at the end of the campaign, it has moved to the west side. And this is really exciting because it, changes, it tells us that there's actually uh, evolution in polarization in, around the black hole. And obviously variability is a really good way to test uh, simulations, to test theoretical models. So it tells us that we're able to see variation in polarization and uh, intensity and angle with the EHT, which is really exciting for new science um, uh, in the future. So what can our images teach us about M87? I'll leave that to Alejandra to tell you all about it. And this is where I leave you off and um, tell you that polarization is really hard and it took us a long time to get here. Um, thank you. Yeah, it was only, uh, I think like 15 minutes to explain one and a half years of, of really hard work by, by many, many people. So <laughs> it's only a small aspect of, of everything that has happened, but it's a, it was quite a, a marathon and, 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 and heavy lifting that, that you all did. Uh, Alejandra, uh, you might want to continue. All right. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Alejandra Jimenez Rosales. And in this part of the seminar, we're going to dive a little bit into what goes, uh, you know, into our modeling and how we compare our models to the observations such, uh, such that we can learn a little bit about, you know, the physics that are underlying this um, newly polarization pattern that we added to our ring. So I'd like to start here where I show you a collection of, you know, a few examples of models that we use to compare to the observations. So the idea is we have our library of models. We know all about our models and we can quantify their properties and then compare to what we see in nature. And, you know, from these, we can uh, say which models work and which one and which models don't work. Um, but how do we actually come about and you know work this out? How do we simulate a black hole? Um, well, the, the setups that we use for our simulations are this. So we start with a black hole that may or may not be rotating, and then it's surrounded by matter that is orbiting, right? This is a, a plasma. Um, and so we also add a magnetic field and due to interactions with the matter and the magnetic field, we expect light to be emitted, synchrotron light as Monica was mentioning. And so this light has to travel through this medium and eventually reach us if it ever does. Um, another feature from this type of calculations is that um, often we get this uh, ejected matter in the poles of the system, right? And we call these jets. So this is just simple schematic that I'm showing you here. Um, this is a little bit more um, stylized. And so we can still see, you know, all the different components. Um, but I would also like to point out like the different uh, morphology of the magnetic field lines that are pictured here with white lines. Uh, and so we can see also how they're permeating like the inside of the jet. Um, so there's one element missing here, and that is the emitted light. So what we can do is we can also calculate images, right? We can place a synthetic camera that tells us what the black hole would look like. And so um, we can put our camera anywhere in space and then just point it towards the black hole and calculate images. And so here on the right, I show you an example of the types of images that we will typically get. Um, and so we see this swirling matter that is rotating and it's going around this um, dark region at the center. And this is the area that we associate to the black hole shadow. Um, now, there are a couple of tricky things in this image. When you look at the, the material that is flowing, you might think that it, this is this orange ring on the left, right? But actually the image is a combination of the jet that is pointing at you, the disc that is behind you, and as you know, a bonus, we also get emission from behind the black hole. 
And this is because uh, the black hole bends space. So at the bottom of the slide, I show you an example where we have a slice of space. And just because we have a black hole there, the emission from behind is going to be bent. So if we apply this to our images, it means that the top part of our image is actually coming from behind. And we also get this a little bit from underneath the image. Um, so that's a quirky fact about these images. The other one is that you see this asymmetry in the emission. And this is also because we have a black hole there at the center. So as you know, matter is going around and light is being emitted, the, the side of the image in which you know, light is coming towards you will actually be brighter as opposed to the side that is receding. So let's just take one of these snapshots, uh, you know, press pause, and then we get these images, right? This is the total intensity. But we can also calculate what the polarization looks like for our models. And so this is what it looks like, right? The direction, the polarization here we represent with these white ticks that I showed you before also. And so the direction of the ticks tells you about um, the plane in which light is oscillating, right? This is polarization. And their length tells you just how much polarized that pixel is. And so these types of configurations, well, these ticks that are on top of these images we call polarization maps. Now, there are many effects that can modify the polarization in our calculations. So here, just to mention a few, we can look at the top panel. And so just the presence of the black hole. As I mentioned before, the black hole is going to bend space, right? So we have this disk, and then the back is going to be bent towards us. But this is not just a 2D effect. This happens in all directions. So if we were to have a photon or a light ray that is kind of traveling towards the black hole, and then you know it, it has to move in this deformed space. Now, it can either go around the black hole once, twice, three times, um, and then maybe fall into the black hole or escape. And if this one reaches us, then just um, to show you there, the polarization is changed already just by this geometrical effect that I'm showing you here um, and due to the presence of the black hole. So this is one of the effects that we have to take into account when we're doing these calculations. Um, another one that I would like to mention is the one here on the right, where you know, the properties of the matter around the black hole are important and they modify polarization. So we can change the temperature, we can change the density, we can change the magnetic field strength in our models, and this is gonna reflect the change in the polarization. So for example, we can have a model where the polarization shows this very ordered pattern. So that's the top panel. And then we can also have, you know, change something in the model that makes the polarization looks very scrambled. And so if you look at the background images, um, they look kind of similar, but the polarization is a dead giveaway that they are really different models, right? So this is another way in which we can use polarization to help us distinguish between different models, which range in different properties for the parameters. And another one that I would really like to draw your attention to, um, this one is a big one, is the magnetic field configuration. So that is the bottom panel. So forget for a moment uh, about the about the schematics that I'm showing you here, just focus on the rings. And so if you look at the polarization patterns, the white ticks, they look different, right? The one on the left that says toroidal actually looks as if all the ticks went from, uh, I don't know, the center of the image outwards, right? In all directions, we call this radial. But when we go to a vertical case, it seems to be wrapping around the black hole. And the only thing that I changed between these two images was the magnetic field geometry. So we can see now in the schematics that, um, so here the, the magnetic field I represent with this 
uh, blue, so on the left, these blue rings. And so polarization is perpendicular to each one of these. And this gives us this rays are kind of going from the center of the image outwards. Whereas in the vertical case, um, the magnetic field is pointing upwards and you know, the polarization behaves differently. And so we can see right away how polarization is very intimately uh, connected to what the magnetic field is doing. So once we take into account all these effects in our calculations and a few others, we arrive to you know, the models in our library. And here I show you, uh, you know, how these models would be viewed by a synthetic camera. But in reality, the EHT resolution is a little lower compared to this one. And so this is how the EHT would see our models, right? So now it's even, even um, more obvious that polarization is really helpful in telling all these models apart, right? This is the image that I showed you at the beginning. Now we've arrived to how we get our models. And so because these are our models, we can also uh, you know, calculate different quantities and compare these to what we see in observations. So we can look at the degree of polarization in the images. We can quantify the polarization pattern. And you know, many of these models have these jets that are pointing towards us. So we can also calculate, for example, the energy that is contained in this ejected material. So when we do this, this is, for example, an example that I show you. So on the left, uh, again, uh, this is what we see. This is the same image that we have presented with the, the orange ring and the lines. Uh, but this one, as Monica mentioned, has a little bit more scientific information in there. Um, so what we focus, for example, in our models is we compare to the length and the color of the ticks. We compare to how much, like we quantify how much they are wrapping around the black hole and you know other quantities, just to mention. And so here at the center, I show you some examples of uh, successful models and some other failed models. And so we can see, for example, the bottom left uh, model that uh, the ticks are not wrapping around and they're also not the right color, right? This is too polarized. Whereas the one to the right of that, so bottom right, the ticks are a little bit wrapping around, not enough, but also this is highly depolarized. So it's too blue. Now in the top, we see two models that look a little bit similar, but not exactly right. Um, and so they are still successful models because the numbers, when we do the calculation of these quantities, they are still within the allowed range of parameter, uh, allowed range that we measure in our image. So there are still successful models. Um, but still applying all these restrictions to our wide library of, of models, um, in the end tells us that the ones who survived were the ones who uh, showed this strong magnetization close to the event horizon. And so what this tells us is that, you know, very close to the black hole, we have these strong magnetic fields, strong enough that they, you know, they are dynamically important, which as Monica was mentioning, means that the black hole has a say in how the black hole is eating the matter. Right, how the matter is falling out to the black hole. So just to bring the point home a little bit more, polarimetry is a very valuable quantity. So uh, it adds more constraints to the models that we previously had. And so here I show you two examples of what we used to know with just the total intensity ring and what we now know with polarimetry. Um, and again, so we have this magnetic field structure that is associated to strong magnetic fields close to the event horizon. And we are not yet sure how to connect the ring to the large scale jet, uh, but we now have one more piece of the puzzle. And uh, yeah, the, the future looks bright. So I'll leave you here with this very nice animation uh, made by Sarah and Monica. And yeah, I thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much uh, for this uh, uh, this nice view of, of of how black holes work. And you know, as I said before, you know, it's not simple. So <laughs> it's a lot of theoretical work as well to actually uh, describe that. Now we already had a lot of questions uh, that we answered in in the Q and A section, but there may be other questions that you want to pose now. So. Um, if, if there are more questions, then please type them into the Q&A and then we can try to answer here. I'm not quite, I don't think we can have you talk, right? Uh, Steven? I think that would be possible if you want. Okay, yeah. Well, so if, if people wanna, wanna um, if, if you wanna, wanna say something then, uh, Stephen, you know, may may make this this is possible. I here's a, a question: uh, What about black hole spin? I don't hear anyone talking about it. So who wants to talk about it now? Monica. Yes, this is very important questions. Probably one of the most important questions: What, the, how fast is this black hole spinning? Unfortunately, polarization is uh, is not that super sensitive to this to the value of the spin. Uh, for, as we know from the models. So we, in our library, we have several models uh, that fit uh, this image, but they have different spins. So at this point, we cannot really say for sure that you know the spin is uh, this, va this value with this error bar. So uh, this, this, uh, the spin is unconstrained yet for M87. That's why we don't talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, but there's, there were some predictions for uh, for the future, right? If you look at variability. Yeah, probably variability is, yeah, spin will control the variability. Um, we would need to make multiple observations, probably, you know, multiple days uh, in a row, not just, you know, four days from two, uh, you know, uh, beginning of the week and, and at the end of the week. So maybe from that in the future, uh, we will be able to to say something more about the spin. At the mo at this time, we don't have like a strong constraint. That's why we don't really, you know, talk about it. So there's a, a question for Mark uh, Kleinwald. Uh, do you see any evidence for uh, mass being ejected? So do we see evidence for the jet in in those images? We still don't know uh, what if this plasma is falling in or for flowing out. Um, for that, again, I think we also need some more observations uh, uh, over different periods of time to, to, to say for, uh, you know, 100%, to be 100% sure what is this plasma doing. So at this point, we, we don't um, know yet. But, you know, from, I mean, I, I would argue that given that, I mean, this is directly connecting to the jet, these are poloidal magnetic fields that we're seeing. I mean, this should be the launching point of the jet, right? So, you know, you, you, for all practical purposes, this is where the jet is anchored, right? Is, is that a wrong description, Monica? Or uh, you, one could say that, but I think this is still a little bit speculative uh, statement. Uh, we know that for sure the magnetic field cannot be entirely toroidal <laughs> wrapped around the black hole. It has to have some vertical component, but you know, uh, I, I think this uh, this would require more research uh, to find out exactly. Well, that, that connects to the next question. What pieces of puzzle are still left to ascertain which models present reality as much as possible? So what, what else do we want to... Uh, do we need to get? Uh, yes, so very uh, crucial piece of information uh, is uh, present in data collected uh, in the next year, in 2018. Uh, this data has more uh, measured uh, polarization at uh, two more frequencies. Um, and uh, from that, we can maybe have more better estimates on the so-called rotation measure towards the <laughs> towards the source, and this will help us to, to um, constrain the models better. So this is like a plasma effect. 
um, rotation measure is a plasma effect that additionally rotates these polarization vectors along the line of sight because of some you know, magnetic fields along the line of sight. So we have to figure this out uh, uh, in the future. Um, okay. And, and there, thank you. And there, there are two questions which are slightly connected. Um, uh, Jamie Reed, how does the polarization allow us to determine how close to the event horizon the magnetic field is? And Frank de Els, does the magnetic field come from inside the black hole or from things outside or at the event horizon? Maybe Alejandra, you want to comment on this? Um, yeah, sure. So the mag we expect the magnetic field to be there because the matter themselves is dragged it all the way into the black hole. And so we would expect the, all this area to be highly magnetized. Now, what we're exploring now is just how strongly magnetized this is. Um, so the, the black hole would just be permeating the outer part of, of uh, I'm sorry, the magnetic field would be permeating the, the outer part of the black hole, um, yeah. Yeah, but it would not go into the black hole, right? Yeah, so it, exactly. it would be in the plasma, would be surrounding it. And uh, um, yeah, and, and we see it on scales of the, uh, of, of the photon orbit, more or less, right? So, or the, the inner more stable circular orbit, so a few short shoot radii. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, it's uh, Francesca Loy. Um, in their models, is the observed magnetic field ejected in, in the uh, in environment or is it confined to the ring? Well, I mean, it's, it's sort of connected to the question we had before. But in the models, you know, if, if what does the magnetic field do in the models? Yeah, so many of our models generate these jets. And the way this happens is because, you know, the black hole is surrounded by this magnetic field that then starts to wrap around and, you know, powers up the matter outside, like in the pole, polar regions. This is how we believe the jets are formed. Um, so yeah, they can be launched out into space. Yeah, that's you know, one of the big questions, of course. Yes. Um, uh, DC Adams, uh, did you begin um, determining uh, the gravitational redshift near the event horizon of the black hole. So are there any, any, any effects of, of, of redshift? I, I don't fully understand the questions, but we are observing almost at the same frequency. Mm. <laughs> it's a monochromatic, uh, to, uh, to some degree, monochromatic image, so we cannot really measure any gravitational redshift or anything like that. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is uh, the yeah, yeah, it's, answer probably, to that's, this question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I, 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 I probably could say that the event horizon is infinite redshift. So that's that, that's what we see, right? So uh, we see that, that infinite redshift, but yeah. Um, how much are you able to generalize, generalize the results to other black holes? Do you expect a large variety of models to be valid for different black holes, or do you expect the majority of black holes to be similar? I have a strong opinion here, but I'm interested to hear your opinions. Monica, maybe, or? Excuse me, I was answering some other question about space <laughs> here, BI, which is, which one question is this from? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, let's do orally now. I mean, don't bother typing okay. now. I think we will we'll stay orally. All right. Um, the, the question was whether uh, you expect a large variety of models to be valid for different black holes, or do we expect the, 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 the majority of black holes to be similar? Um, I think they can be different. Uh, we don't know. This is something yet to be answered. Uh, we need more observations to uh, to find out, I think. Um, for example, M87 and Sagittarius A star comparison is interesting. Uh, we don't know uh, if the accretion and jet formation look similar in these two sources, but this is something probably that we can answer in the near future, like uh, soon. <laughs> but other black holes out there in, in the universe, uh, uh, 
but, but we um, believe that acc accretion physics and jet physics is similar in, in the entire universe, but uh, this is uh, yeah to be tested in the future. It's, it's, yeah, it's probably always a question to ask what is different and what is similar. You know, all people or all people are alike more or less, but they they all have their characteristics, right? So yeah, so black holes different black holes pro, uh, um, accrete matter or eat matter at different rate. For example, so Sagittarius A star does not is on starvation, and M87 is swallowing, uh, you know, um, significantly more matter. So there is a difference between these two systems in this respect. For example, but still, luckily, I mean, you know, black holes are simpler than than us people. So, uh, <laughs> so maybe less variety than than. Than among people, yeah. They could have different spins, for example, yeah. right? Uh, that would make them different. Um, um, yeah, there was a question on, on space, VOBI. Did you answer that? Um, uh, yes, that's the many, many people is actually thinking about imaging black holes from space by launching antennas into space and, and having a big array in space, but. Uh, I think this is uh, a matter of future, maybe in next 20, 40 years, I would say, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope before, you know, I, certainly after my retirement, I hope before my death, but you never know what's first, so. Um, That's a ex very expensive experiment, so it also depends on bounty. <laughs> But, but at least you get very high resolution. I mean, this, and you get very high image quality. So it's definitely, I mean, that will bring the entire field to a completely different level. Um, <laughs> questions about funding. What are the expectations for funding the continuation of your research, especially since so many people and institutions are involved? We leave it to you, Heino. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually you brought in more funding now. So uh, it's, um, We'll, we'll still, you know, we're still looking for funding. It's uh, uh, there is funding at different places. It's a good thing it's it's a broad collaboration. So there are many people working on it, um, and we hope to also secure more uh, serious funding. Where in fact we have submitted proposals again, so we don't give up. Um, uh, let me see. Yeah, well, a question that often comes up, uh, maybe no, to Sarah because she hasn't answered any 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 of them yet. What is so observationally so handy about M87? Why everything is published on M87 and not on other black holes? Um, yeah, that's an easy answer. <laughs> M87 is the best. Um, so why M87? Uh, so we have our two sources that we observe with the Event Horizon Telescope, M87 and Sagittarius A star. That's because they are the biggest black holes on the sky. Their angular size is big enough for us to be able to image with the EHT with our Earth-sized telescope. So there are only two black holes reachable with an Earth-sized telescope to image its, its shadow. Um, the reason why we published M87 first instead of Sagittarius A star is because it's about a thousand times more massive than Sag A star. And the more massive a black hole is, the slower time is around it. And so the gas around it moves much slower than for Sagittarius A star. So if we stare at it for about eight hours, which is the length of our daily observations with the EHT, the gas doesn't move that much. So we can actually use this technique that I talked about called aperture synthesis to combine measurements over time and over our spatial coverage and actually make an image. For Sagittarius A star, um, there the gas moves on, on time scales of minutes. So if you look at it over eight hours, every few minutes it looks different. So if you're trying to make an eight hour image, it's gonna look like a blur. Think of it like taking a long exposure, right? So M87 is like taking a long exposure image of a person just sitting still, like an adult sitting still waiting to have their portrait. And for Saji Star, it's like taking a long exposure of a running wild toddler. Uh, so if you try to do that, you'll end up with just a giant blur. So in order to analyze that data, because it's so variable, we need to um, obviously develop new techniques and new methods to cross-check. And as you saw uh, for my talk, cross-checking and making sure we understand each portion of the image is a really important and lengthy process for us at the EHT. Understanding our instrument, understanding whether we know the entire signal that comes from the source and how it translates into an image are a really crucial part of our scientific journey. 
And so for Sagittarius, it starts much more lengthy to get to this point. Um, but it is coming and we're working on it really hard and we worked on it in parallel with our polarization work and we hope to have something to show you for Sagittarius star really soon. Yeah, well, we'll have two, two, or, two or three more questions uh, and then we'll, we'll wrap up. But maybe stay with an observational question, uh, Asara. Um, the, the polarization and variability, Francesco Travaglini asks, uh, you know, the, the, the changes of a four day period uh, are the data already fully processed, investigated uh, concerning this possibility? Uh, or could it be that we are seeing effects of something on the line of sight that changes the, the polarization? Uh, or is the source actually too small that we could actually see that, uh, that variability? Um, yeah, so the variability we're observing is at the black hole. So it is uh, in the structure of this polarization, uh, polarized light that comes from the gas around the black hole. And we see variability also in our total light. We see some changes in the brightness distribution along the ring over our, our six day span of our observation. Mm -hmm. And we see also changes in polarization. What is a difficult task is because we only have you know, four kind of snapshots. Uh, it's not enough for theoretical models to be able to really pinpoint what exactly is changing. So is it really like one part that is moving to another part? Is it one part that gets brighter or dimmer? Uh, that, that is still uh, difficult to, to analyze. And so we hope with more observations, or as Monica said, more frequent observations of the source, you know, many days in a row will actually help us trace more clearly these kind of variability and be able to actually pinpoint what is really changing in our, in our theoretical models. Yes. Will the data actually be made public eventually? Yes, yes, it will definitely be made public. It's a very important part of our process to make our data available for cost checks. Yeah, and then maybe uh, uh, last questions, I combine the two, a uh, bit more speculative. Uh, you know, we usually invoke magnetic fields if we, if we don't know something, but it seems here magnetic fields are really, really crucial to get jets launched. Um, maybe Monica or so, are there, there ways to launch the jets without uh, magnetic fields, um, and are there plans to image uh, sources or can we image sources without jets actually? I think uh, synchrotron emission for the ring is the simplest explanation and I cannot think about anything else. So it has to be magnetic field producing this polarization. You can also produce polarization uh, via reflection of light from some surface, but I don't think this is the case here. The ring has such a high brightness temperature that this is for sure synchrotron emission. So, and there are the theories for jet uh, production uh, without magnetic fields, but uh, here we for sure see this magnetic field. So, you know, these other theories would uh, not survive <laughs> this uh, yeah. new observational constraint. Yeah, totally. And what was the second one? Uh, well, are we also, can we look at non-jet yes. sources? Yes, so for example, galactic center, supermassive black hole, uh, we, it's a radio source, but radio source, just like M87, but we are not entirely sure if this uh, black hole has a jet or not. So maybe, you know, in the future we'll find out. Uh, it's definitely possible to have magnetic fields around the black hole uh, that are not producing a jet. For example, if magnetic fields are turbulent, like tangled up, uh, uh, you know, you can still see this kind of synchrotron emission and polarization, but no jet. Yeah, so it's, it's a possible situation, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Mm. I, yeah, I think I don't see any, any other questions and everything else has been, uh, well, some thanks here. Um, well, there's some more coming in, but uh, well, me last question, Monica, I'll put you on the spot here or, or, or actually Alejandra, let, let, me, let me ask Alejandra because you know, uh, Monica has been answering more questions yet. Uh, can, we, can we rule out spin zero already? Oh, that's a tough question. If we want to associate the the ring and launching magnetic fields, uh, and you know, launching this jet to the larger scale jet, then no, we need the spin. Um, but I think so far, 
um, yeah, we have had models that could have this spin zero and they could also um, satisfy the constraints. So I guess we don't know yet, um, but yeah. Yeah, but I think we, we are leaning towards spin, but you know, the, the final proof is still, still missing indeed, yeah. Uh, which is good, which you know, uh, is enough work for us to do in, in the future. I think you know the spin is a big prize, as Monica said before, one of the big questions to answer. Thank you all for watching. Um, thank you particular to the three speakers who have been you know, not only working very hard, but also been very proudly presenting it today and very capable uh, presenting that to us. Thank you for communicating this and being, being, being available for, for these questions. And they're actually all, all on Twitter, so if you bug them with questions, you know, they actually still tend to answer, um, even though it has been a lot uh, in the last couple of days, but uh, it's something I think we, we like to do. Um, there'll be more, uh, more news in the, in the coming months. Uh, there are many other data sets that are still being worked on, not, not only uh, ZHS Star and M87, um, so AHT is, is fully busy and functioning, and we still have a lot of fun. I wish you a good afternoon and uh, hope to see you back, uh, at, hopefully at some point in person, either you know, in our university in the Netherlands or somewhere in, around the world where you are right now. Bye-bye. <laughs>